Welcome to Nordic Security in an Insecure Europe, a panel produced by the American Scandinavian Foundation and focusing on the security issues and threats currently confronting the Nordic nations. I'm Ed Gallagher, president of the American Scandinavian Foundation. This panel will be moderated by Dr. Eric Einhorn, who will be joined by authorities on foreign and security policy from Denmark, Finland, and Sweden. This program is being recorded and will be made available on our website, ScandinaviaHouse.org, as well as on our YouTube page. Feel free to ask questions in the Q&A section, and we will get to them at the end of the talk. It's a pleasure to uh, introduce Dr. Eric Einhorn, a longtime friend of the American Scandinavian Foundation, who received funding for postdoctoral work in Denmark uh, from the foundation in 1977 and served on our fellowship committee for a number of years. He is a professor of emeritus of political science and adjunct professor of Scandinavian studies at the University of Massachusetts in Amherst, where he continues his research and area studies activities. He has been at the uh, University of Massachusetts since 1971. Prior to that, he studied international relations in undergraduate at University of Pennsylvania, and he earned his PhD in political science at Harvard University. His teaching and research bridge the comparative and foreign policy fields with a focus on Western Europe and the United States, and especially the Nordic region. His most recent work has been in comparative political economy. He has traveled extensively throughout Europe and the Nordic regions, and it's a great pleasure to have him with us today. I turn it over to you, Eric. Thank you very much, Ed, and welcome to our audience. Uh, it's a privilege to do this. I have uh, watched these seminars, but it's a privilege now to be part of one. I want to introduce our panelists. Uh, I'll introduce them all, and then we'll go uh, across in the order that uh, basically alphabetical order. Um, it, I'm very thankful, given the time differences, it's not easy to arrange uh, a transatlantic uh, webinar, but thanks to the uh, willingness of our panel, we have a good number of uh, experts at our command. The first I will introduce is from Helsinki, Finland. Uh, Katja Kreutz is program director of the Global Security Research Program at the Finnish Institute of International Affairs. Her main field of expertise is international law and especially issues of responsibility, human rights, and global governance. She has also published extensively on Nordic relations in the field of foreign and security policy, and she holds a Doctor of Laws de Law degree and Master of Law degrees from the University of Helsinki and a Master of Political Science from Ovo Academy in uh, Ovo. Uh, she has previously worked as a research fellow at the Eric Castrain Institute of International Law and, Inter and Human Rights of the University of Helsinki. She's author of several works, but uh, what most, one most recently, State Responsibility in the International Legal Order, a Critical Appraisal. Welcome, Katja. August Danielson is our next uh, uh, panelist. And he is an associate fellow of the Swedish Institute of International Affairs and a PhD candidate at Uppsala University in Sweden. His research focuses on diplomatic practices, EU foreign and security policy, as well as visual diplomacy, which perhaps he'll explain. Uh, he holds a master's degree in political science from Uppsala University and has previously worked at the Swedish Ministry of Foreign Affairs. He's co-author of a volume, The Everyday Making of EU Foreign and Security Policy, and his work has been published in several professional journals. Last is an old friend of mine and uh, a person who I've known for many years. Hans Moritzen is a senior research uh, researcher at uh, foreign policy and diplomacy at the Danish Institute for International Studies. He has developed th theory on autonomy of international organizations, small state foreign policy in a spatial context, and how external danger affects domestic cohesion, and how the historical memory impacts foreign policy decisions. He is co-editor of the annual Danish Foreign, uh, foreign Policy Review and participates in several other projects at the DIIS. So those are our panelists. Um, I, we will start now with uh, uh, 
Dr. Kreutz. Let me remind you that you can submit questions and comments. They will be, uh, we can't probably go to all of them, but you can submit them at any time on the, uh, through your webinar uh, page, and they will be uh, treated a little later in the panel. So welcome Katya, and we look forward to hearing your presentation. Thank you, Eric, for the kind inter introduction, and thank you to the organizers for inviting me to speak at this webinar. And the topic Scandinavian security is, of course, critical, uh, a critical topic for Finland, because we live next to a great power that has shown willingness to wage a full-scale war against its neighbors. So for Finland, it's really a matter of our nation's life and death, uh, so to speak. Let me start by stating a few facts that I find are important for the discussion today. First, uh, Finland has altogether, as part of Sweden and on its own, fought around 30 to 40 wars against Russia. So this tells you on the one hand that Russia has an imperialist uh, history and agenda, and on the other hand, that we are prepared in Finland. Second, Finland shares almost 840 miles of border with Russia, a fact that we cannot escape now nor in the future. Third, it's also noteworthy that in the post-Cold War period, Finland, among very few nations, never downsized its military. Neither did we get rid of the conscription system. So for Finland, the decisive moment for seeking to change our previous military non-alignment took place before February 24th this year. Already last year, when Russia demanded in writing replies from the West on restricting NATO expansion, Finnish freedom of action, sovereignty, if you will, was breached. And President Nienestö of Finland has admitted that it was this very moment that changed his attitude towards seeking NATO membership. The popular support in Finland for NATO membership uh, were in the old days around 30%. An equal number was firmly opposed to NATO membership and the rest were undecided. And today the popular rate for NATO exception is uh, 76%. So there has been a huge increase in support for NATO. And the one question that, that I've had uh, to answer the most times in the last months really is how it's possible that the popular support for NATO could go up so fast and whether this change will be permanent. And one obvious uh, answer is of course our history. We have all had grandfathers fighting in the winter or continuation war. And most of us know people or family that lived in those parts of Finland that we had to surrender to Soviet Union. What is more, I think, uh, the brutality of the industrial warfare shown on media now in Ukraine has decisively affected Finns. Instead of, of some green little men operations, we have seen willful criminal destruction of life, uh, sheer evil, if you will. And then a few words on the application process itself. So on May 17th this year, Finland handed in NATO application together with Sweden. And the main reasoning behind this is deterrence. The likelihood of Russia attacking Finland as a NATO country is considered to be significantly lower uh, so even though we repeat always here in Finland that there is no immediate threat against Finland, Russia has removed uh, a lot of its military equipment from our vicinity. The political leadership, that is the president together with the government, paid way for the application and a smooth process by shuttle diplomacy. And no objections were presented by a single country, not even from Turkey. All along, the support from the United States was, of course, crucial. Today, only two members of the alliance have not ratified Finnish accession to NATO, and that is Hungary and Turkey. In advance, there were some thoughts in Finland that Hungary could be tricky because Finnish-Hungarian relations are not the best due to rule of law issues in the European Union. And Turkey was more of an open question. 
In order to meet the agreement struck between uh, Turkey, Finland and Sweden in Madrid uh, last summer, Finnish leadership has stressed the significance of anti-terrorism work, but it has also stated that it has basically done all it can to meet Turkey's demands. So in Finland, we see that Sweden is rather the target of Turkey. And if the process drags on, there might be increasing discussion in Finland on whether we should wait for Sweden or not. So what will change with NATO membership? As I said with uh, earlier on, uh, the NATO membership is mostly about deterrence. Whether the nuclear umbrella is important or not for Finland is really not discussed here much that much. And one reason for that is really that Finland lacks uh, expertise in nuclear weapons, due, of course, to historical reasons. Of course, it cannot be denied that in case of an attack against Finland, we would seek assistance from allies. We would not expect boots on the ground. Finland can mobilize 280 thousand conscripts easily and several hundred thousands more to fill in if need be. What we would need is ammunition over time, air defense assistance and intelligence. Finland invests around 2% of its GDP this year to defense, but this will increase to 2.2% in the coming years due to the war in Ukraine. And for example, last year, Finland uh, invested 9.4 billion US dollars in buying 64 F-35 fighter jets from Lockheed Martin. NATO membership is crucial for better planning of the defense when it comes to the Nordics and the Baltics. And when Finland and Sweden join NATO, this will make the alliance stronger, allow for better planning, better execution of defense. It will make training, and exchange of intelligence easier. And it will also enhance NATO's Arctic presence. However, we recognize that our relationship with Russia has permanently changed. We do not have any ongoing political relations with Russia currently. Neither do we foresee good relations with Russia for the coming decades. But we will still need to have some sort of relation with Russia when it comes to border issues and cooperation in the Gulf of Finland. But more than that is difficult. In fact, the Finnish parliament has just decided to build a wall along the border. Taken that there are 85,000 Russians living in Finland, 35,000 of them have dual nationality. The war is tricky to handle at societal level. It's also increasingly considered to be a veritable security risk. Our solidarity to Ukraine is very visible in Finland. We have received Ukrainian refugees as most European countries. We donate money to the Ukrainians. We deliver military assistance, and this is unprecedented, of course. There are volunteers from Finland in fighting in Ukraine. And overall, in Finland, we do not foresee a situation where Ukraine would be losing the war. That's not an option in our mind. We follow closely how the US supports Europe and how the Indo-Pacific region, for example, is mentioned along with Europe in the recent national security strategy, for example. While the need for Europe to take more responsibility for its own defense is much discussed here, uh, we have trust in the good and ever deepening Finnish US relations. And the track record from last year's indicates nothing else irrespective of who occupies the White House in the future. Thank you. These were my remarks, and I look forward to the discussion later on. Thanks. Thank you very much, Katya. That was excellent, and also right on the nose as far as time goes, so congratulations. <laughs> um, there are a lot of questions you raised that we'll come back to, I'm sure, because they're, uh, they're important. Now I'm, it's, I will turn the microphone over to August Danielson for to hear from Sweden. Yeah, thanks a lot, Eric. Uh, yeah, so I will talk a little bit about the uh, Swedish response uh, to the Russian invasion of, of Ukraine. And uh, of course, uh, this will you know, echo a lot of what uh, Katja has just said, even though I think the sort of historical uh, backgrounds, of course, differ 
quite substantially. Um, but as many of you already know, uh, Sweden has uh, over the past uh, nine months or so, I would say, uh, gone through sort of the, the most radical shift in uh, Swedish uh, foreign and security policy uh, since essentially prior to the, the uh, World War One and World War Two. Um, and while our status as a neutral country was uh, broken uh, already 30 years ago when we entered the EU, we have still um, sort of maintained our, our status as a military non-aligned um, uh, state. But by applying to NATO, uh, that was, of course, um, you know, we, we ditched that policy of being non-aligned, uh, which means that we will, for the first time, uh, in in modern history, at least, have have true sort of security guarantees, and of course also an obligation to to protect others. Um, given that Sweden is already very interconnected with NATO and was already very interconnected with NATO prior to the Russian invasion, um, the actual application itself, and I would even say the membership itself, is not know uh, what the actual shift is about uh, i would say that the the choice to apply and the potential membership again uh, is rather representative of uh, the huge shift in mentality uh, regarding security policy that has taken place in sweden um, and just to contextualize this a little bit um, the previous government uh, social democratic government um, or red green government here in sweden uh, which was replaced back in, in September, uh, worked off what was called the Hultqvist uh, Doctrine, which was uh, named after the uh, Swedish or the then defense minister, uh, Peter Hultqvist. And, and this uh, doctrine or, or security strategy essentially emphasized the importance of the, the US-Swedish uh, bilateral uh, relationship. Um, so essentially, the, the idea was to do what we could to ensure that uh, the U.S. would would come to Sweden's aid if we were um, ever under attack. Um, and prior to the Russian invasion, this strategy was perceived, at least by the the previous government, to be a, a sufficient uh, security guarantee uh, for two reasons. Um, both in the in the sense that uh, Sweden felt that the United States would never let a Western country uh, that despite the fact that we were not members of NATO, uh, still were sufficiently close to, I guess, the uh, Western security order uh, that we would not be sort of left without military support in, in case we were uh, attacked. Uh, but also because uh, the threat from Russia uh, was, I would say, you know, prior to um, February 24th, uh, quite low. Uh, despite the fact that the the war in Ukraine ha has been going on uh, already for for eight years, um, but the the full scale invasion of of Ukraine, uh, of course, changed Sweden's views on both of these aspects. Um, uh, although the actual choice to apply for membership was likely very much a result of the fact that that Finland, of course, you know, had had already signaled uh, that they would apply likely with or without Sweden uh, was the was the sense that I got at least. Um, and since that was the signal, uh, Sweden could could simply not uh, risk standing alone in in the Baltic Sea uh, without uh, security guarantees. Um, so the full scale invasion of, of Ukraine made the former uh, Swedish government realize that the informal security guarantee from uh, the United States was not sufficient. Um, Ukraine, uh, of course, also had very strong ties to NATO prior to the Russian invasion, uh, and that was, as you know by now, uh, not enough for, for NATO or the US to intervene uh, militarily. Um, so the, the invasion, I think, really clarified sort of the, the line uh, between being a member and, and not being a member of NATO. Uh, and it is, of course, only within NATO then that you can expect uh, the type of support that you get. Um, you know, the security guarantees that you get as, as being a member of NATO. Um, and the invasion, uh, I think, also showcased that Russian territorial aggression uh, was far more unpredictable uh, than what uh, security experts and military experts had, had thought. Um, again, despite the fact that, that Russia had already uh, annexed Crimea um, uh, in, in 2014. 
Um, so the fear that Russia might sort of extend uh, the conflict to Swedish territory, uh, for instance, on the island of Gotland, was suddenly you know, a far more realistic uh, scenario uh, in the minds of, of policymakers and, and security experts, which again, I think, made Sweden's NATO application much more uh, both realistic and, and necessary. Um, so that is sort of where we are today. Sweden has, uh, as you know, applied for membership, but it is still waiting for uh, its application to be ratified, as Katja mentioned. Um, and a lot of media attention has has been focused on the threat of the uh, Turkish veto. Uh, and uh, as Katja mentioned, uh, an agreement was reached by by Turkey, Sweden, and Finland in, in June earlier this year in Madrid. Um, and the deal between Sweden and Turkey is still up in the air. Turkey is arguing that Sweden has still not delivered uh, on a lot of its promises. Uh, and the main issue here seems to be regarding the extradition uh, of a number of Swedish citizens and residents uh, with uh, Kurdish backgrounds uh, who, who Turkey uh, are accusing of uh, being terrorists, essentially. Um, and whether or not this is actually just a theater or you know, if the actual negotiations are ongoing between the US and Turkey, I think is, you know, impossible to know. There are speculations about that. Uh, but but of course, it is very, it's a very tricky situation. And and some uh, are, you know, saying that Turkey may hold out on their veto, even until the, uh, the, the Turkish election next summer, just as a way to increase Erdogan's, uh, you know, domestic popularity. Uh, so again, we, we don't really know when this veto will be dropped, uh, but I mean, it likely will uh, eventually. I think the issue here really is that there are very few instruments to sort of regulate uh, Turkey's actions in this case. Um, so if we speak about sort of having sticks and carrots, you know, when dealing with cooperation partners, uh, then Sweden and the U.S. only have uh, carrots to give out uh, to uh, to Turkey. Um, and if you don't have sticks, such as you know the threat of of kicking uh, Turkey out of NATO, then you will have to give quite a lot of carrots uh, in order to make sure that the the deal happens. So we will see how many carrots, <laughs> I guess, will have to be given out. Uh, but I also just want to to uh, briefly mention uh, Hungary as well, uh, the, the second veto, I guess, state here. Uh, and a lot uh, less media attention has, has been placed uh, on the fact that Hungary has yet to ratify uh, Sweden's application for membership. Uh, and it is quite probable that, that Hungary is holding out uh, until Turkey has, has dropped their veto. Uh, to see sort of what kind of concessions that that they can also force uh, Sweden to accept. Um, given that Hungary has acted as sort of the main spoiler in, in EU negotiations over, you know, the last decade, essentially, uh, especially in foreign policy issues, uh, this is not a very unusual role for them to be in, um, to be the one, you know, the last sort of state standing. Um, but I, I should say, you know, given what I just mentioned about the, the instruments of sticks and carrots, I think that the toolbox of instruments that can be used in order to convince Hungary is quite, you know, bigger uh, in comparison to what there is available for, for Turkey. Um, so in other words, we have both, you know, sticks and carrots that can be used against Turkey. Uh, and that is not least shown in, in the case, um, um, you know, you know, in, in the coming weeks, I, there is a decision, for instance, to be taken uh, about withholding, I think, 7.5 billion euros in, in EU funds to, to Hungary due to concerns about um, Hungarian democracy and, and, and corruption. Um, and of course, this type of stick uh, does not exist in the case of, of Sweden's and, and the United States relations to Turkey, at least not, you know, to the same extent. So uh, I think that veto will probably be a little bit easier to overcome. Uh, but uh, but again, we will see. It's still very much up in there. So it'll be interesting to see how this develops in the coming weeks and months. Thanks. OK, thank you very much, August. That uh, touched on some uh, common and some new issues. Uh, and we will no doubt come back to them. So it's now my privilege to turn the microphone over to uh, Hans Morrison uh, and uh, a little further away from Russia, but still close enough um, and uh, see what he, what the Danish reaction has been. Hans. 
Yes, uh, thank you. Thank you for the invitation. And uh, it's an honor to be to be with you, all of you. Uh, it's, uh, I'll start by saying that uh, most, most European countries have, uh, have been either doves or hawks in, the, in relation to Russia during uh, the last 20 years or something. Uh, but uh, Denmark has actually fluctuated very much between being a hawk or dove. Uh, sometimes we have had uh, benign relations with Russia, other times uh, the opposite. Uh, so, so, but but uh, after after 2014 with the with the Crimea, uh, we have taken a quite a hawkish attitude. Not as much as Poland and, and the Baltic countries, but still quite quite uh, quite close to them. Uh, then, with the outbreak of war in February this year. Uh, there was uh, Danish uh, condemnation, as as for most Western countries, and uh, some military equipment was offered to Ukraine and some uh, funding also. And first and foremost, the reception of uh, refugees. So uh, the the normal the normal xenophobia that we have in this country to refugees in certain quarters at least was was gone with the wind. So, so uh, that that was quite another ball game. Uh, among the political parties, uh, well, they were quite united. There, there was no domestic issue about this. And um, about the media, I can say uh, that the, the media uh, can hardly be can hardly be seen as uh, impartial. Uh, they are actually, if you look at the sources they are using, uh, it's they are relying very much on the on MI6, MI5, the British intelligence, and uh, very much on the U, U, the Ukraine uh, defense ministry. So, so in that sense, uh, they they are not impartial to put it put it that way. But I guess that applies to to uh, many Western countries. Um, and uh, then if you go to public opinion, uh, it feels very much like Hungary 1956. I'm too, I'm, after all, I'm too young to remember that. Um, but um, that, there was also this kind of massive public opinion in support of, uh, of Hungary at, at, at that time. Uh, I can mention a small anecdote to you to show you something about the mood. And the, the, the anecdote is that we have, we have a so-called so flag law in Denmark, which is much firmer and stricter than in Sweden. Uh, I don't know about Finland, but the Danish flag law says that you can only, you, you are not allowed to have a foreign flag uh, because, or, or if you have, you have to have a Danish flag joining and the Danish flag must be bigger than the foreign flags, uh, if you see what I mean. So you cannot put a foreign flag in your garden and then just say, I, I want to do that. But as soon as this uh, war started, th there was suddenly an exemption from the flag law. And you know, this is a law that is, has been for hundreds of years. So, so, so it's very difficult to change that kind of thing. But suddenly that was pure possible. And so it was said that you can, you can uh, you can uh, you can uh, have the Ukrainian flag, and it has been on all, on uh, most public buildings, on the Folketing, on on uh, on um, in, in in at the local level, in people's gardens or in windows. So that's just to show you uh, how the mood is here. Of course, <coughs> the mood can always be exploited by by competent politicians. So. They have two things have happened. Uh, first of all, there has been a national compromise, so-called national compromise on defense. So that defense spending has gone up. Uh, and uh, I, I'm not sure of the numbers, but we aim towards uh, 2%, the magic 2% uh, towards uh, 2030. Uh, we should get to that level. Uh, 
another thing, the second thing that that politicians did was to uh, suggest, or the government suggest, suggested a referendum on the EU defense opt-out that we, we had, uh, as you may know, uh, we have had this since we became members of the, of the EU actually. And uh, this was, uh, the opt-out was a consequence, not because we were afraid of Russia or anybody, but because we were afraid of, of European integration. So, so um, uh, anyway, this was, uh, now that the mood in the country was very much pro-defense, uh, politi politicians uh, uh, suggested that we, have, we had a, should have a referendum on, on abolishing this, this, this uh, opt-out. Uh, they had, un until that point, they had uh, believed that there's no chance of a, uh, people will never uh, uh, vote for abolishing the opt-out. Uh, but now they did. And uh, so that was by 1st June this year. So now well, this uh, opt-out is, is history. Uh, also, I, I will uh, finish by mentioning uh, the, the Nord Stream that I'm sure you have uh, the pipelines, Nord Stream pipelines at the bottom of the Baltic Sea. Uh, the, actually, the first one was, uh, uh, was actually one that uh, made Danish-Russian relations much better because Denmark said, okay, you can have the, this uh, pipeline in Danish territorial waters. That was back in 2009. But then, as you know, there came suggestions for a second pipeline, and uh, uh, that was very controversial, as you know. But uh, in uh, it, it goes in Danish economic zone, and there was no possible for Denmark to, to deny. Uh, there was a, there was a in certain environmental concerns that were fulfilled, so uh, that was decided. And uh, then, as you all know, this whole thing exploded uh, in, in literally. Uh, uh, and uh, I don't know, it's very few people know who did it. Um, as, as you know, with the picture I'm giving of the media, you know that, that it, it, it's not surprising that many thought at, that this can only be Russia. But you can argue forth and back about that because uh, it is not, I mean, it, it's, it's not to Russia's advantage to blow up their own pipelines. I mean, which, which uh, if they had, the, if they still had these pipelines, they would be able to send a little bit of gas and then close down and then, then um, uh, open up again. And in that way, affect the Germans. I, I, I quite don't quite see what, what should be Russia's uh, self-interest in this. But anyway, that's a long uh, discussion. Uh, I don't know if we, we ever get uh, an answer to, to, to how this happened. But I will finish for now I, uh, and uh, we'll, I'll come back when, uh, let's, when we have the discussion in the panel or, or, or with the audience. So, so thank you very much. Thank you very much, Hans. Um, very good. I, I really appreciated that, um, that, that those presentations and we'll give people a chance uh, in the audience to uh, either send in or, or think of some questions they might answer. Uh, I can't add too much to the excellent presentations you've just heard. Let me just touch on one or two things that are very important and that maybe we can come back to. Uh, actually, Scandinavia has, even during the Cold War, tried to keep the region a low tension region, relatively speaking, that is to say, uh, to make sure that nothing was done unnecessarily provocative. Um, and that's why, for example, Denmark and, and, and Norway did not allow uh, any NATO or US bases on their domestic territory, Greenland being somewhat separate. Uh, Finland uh, ran a very careful and balanced policy, but um, actually managed to turn its un un unhappy relations with Russia, uh, the Soviet Union, into what were uh, fairly um, uh, profitable relations toward the uh, toward the uh, end of the Cold War. Um, so much so that when the Cold War ended and Russia collapsed, it really hit the Finnish economy. Finland still has or has had 
uh, very close economic relations as well as uh, complicated political relations with Russia and Eastern Europe. Um, so there have been these uh, these ongoing issues uh, from the Cold War that have kind of faded for a while and now come back in somewhat different form. Secondly, uh, we also uh, have the issue of the Baltic states, um, Latvia, Estonia, and Lithuania, which is not our topic today directly, but the North, the, uh, the Baltic states, of course, have a very have a, a very um, uh, complicated history with Russia and the Soviet Union. Uh, they have uh, large uh, Russian minorities in at least two of the countries, and uh, their relations with Russia have been anything but friendly, though they've been correct and peaceful as such, but they are very feel very vulnerable. The Nordic countries, um, through the European Union and now for, uh, through NATO, have commitments and, and close ties to the Baltic countries, and in some areas, the Baltic countries have been made into honorary Nordic countries and in, in certain areas of cooperation and uh, for example between, uh, each of the Nordic uh, countries has had ver uh, aid programs and other uh, ways of tightening their relations. I don't know how much of this spills over into military so for example whether Finland uh, and uh, Estonia which uh, are neighbors across the uh, Gulf of Finland ha have some co common issues that may come become more important during the uh, during when, if, when fin finished NATO membership is done. Another area that was touched but uh, with by hence was this issue of the pipelines, uh, which are, uh, as he said, still have a lot of unanswered questions. But the issue of infrastructure uh, in the North Sea, we don't have a Norwegian here, but of course Norway has extremely uh, important offshore oil, gas uh, uh, installations that are now ever more important uh, indeed, uh, they recently just opened a pipeline to Poland, which is under the current circumstances very important. So there are these areas of infrastructure um, in the North Sea that uh, where NATO uh, can play a, a role of helping Norway uh, to protect, but they also spill over into the other, uh, other Nordic countries. And finally, I'd like to just raise the question of whether or not our panelists later when we come back for their comments, uh, Diplomacy has always been a strong suit among the Nordic countries and Scandinavian countries. Uh, they have had a long uh, list of outstanding uh, international statesmen. And it's somewhat ironic that right now the uh, General Secretary of NATO, uh, Jens Stoltenberg, is a no former Norwegian prime minister. Um, and before that, there was a Danish uh, prime minister, former prime minister as head of NATO. So diplomacy and uh, leadership in international organizations is a Scandinavian strong point. But what about diplomacy uh, during conflict situations? I mean, the issue of can the war in Ukraine uh, be ended by effective diplomacy? Can the Nordic countries and their, their experts, um, especially the Finnish foreign ministry, which has had very uh, low history in dealing with difficult Russians, uh, play a leading role in perhaps finding some uh, diplomatic path? That would be a question that uh, many people have asked. Uh, I know the Finnish ambassador in Washington is uh, valued for his experience in Moscow, and I'm sure there are other, many others as well. Um, I think that's really all that I want to add right now. Uh, though, uh, well, one more, one more little point that we may come back to, and that's Europe, uh, the European Union, which has uh, uh, for many years had on its agenda this uh, common uh, security and defense policy. That was the uh, issue that uh, Hans referred to when the Danes uh, voted overwhelmingly to end their uh, opt out. But we don't really know what the, whether the Europeans have opted in to uh, much defense cooperation beyond NATO. And that has always been an issue in Washington as well as in Europe uh, of whether or not European uh, defense cooperation comes as an addition and strengthening of NATO or whether it becomes an alternative and maybe even a weakening of NATO. And even the, uh, the main proponent of uh, European cooperation in this area, France, uh, as we know, has had a very complicated relationship with NATO. So I just raise that issue if we come back to it later on. So uh, Kyle has been managing questions, and I don't know if we have a, a few, but maybe we should let people uh, on the panel answer first any ad additions that they might want to make. Uh, if you just signal me. And
I think you're muted still, Eric. All right. I'm sorry. I'll let Kyle uh, open up the microphones of the uh, people who want to make comments. Kyle, do you want to call on uh, on Hans first, and then uh, Katya, and then August? Okay. Uh, uh, so Hans. Oh. I don't know. I'm. Oh. Uh, yes, I, I'm <laughs> unmuted now, so maybe I was supposed to okay. go first. Okay. I, I have no idea, <laughs> but no problem. <laughs> okay, so. Um, Yes, a few comments on all what the panel, other panelists said and also what bro was Eric brought up here. So just trying to be quick as we time is limited. So first I would like to point out that uh, August spoke about the informal guarantees and the US, uh, Sweden had had relations and, and expectations in security and defense, but Finland always had a very different um, relationship to the US due to Soviet Union and Russia. So, so the US was for us politically sensitive and we didn't have any guarantees. So in that sense, we were very different. Um, and then of course with, with uh, Turkey and um, also there's of course speculation in Finland, how much Russia and Putin actually are able to influence um, Erdogan in, in, in this uh, vetoing of membership. So there are, of course, many open questions. I would like also to say about Norway, since we don't have a Norwegian representative, that Finland has turned very much to no Norway in this process as well. So Sweden is the most, uh, cl the closest bilateral ally, but Norway we look very much to in hope of learning how NATO functions and pecking orders and so forth. But also because Norway shares a border with Russia, so we have that thing in common which we lack with Sweden. Uh, the flag law was Hans really interesting. We don't have any similar here. So we mainly have Ukrainian flags and not Finnish flags <laughs> if it's not a special day. And uh, Eric posed good questions about whether Finland could mediate something. Uh, and of course we've known for that and we've been bragging with having special expertise of in, in Russia and Russian relations well. That didn't turn out very well for Finland then. But anyways, uh, of course, the President Niinistö has been calling Putin regularly until uh, the final call when he just called to say that we are applying for NATO and you caused this and goodbye, basically. So after that, there has not been any conversations. And he has also, President Niinistö indicated that he doesn't want to uh, call him or be in touch because he has nothing really to say. So there's also a personal, I think, disappointment with with these relations. So I think Finland does not want to pressure Ukraine into um, peace. So Finland wants that to be that initiative to come also from Ukraine. Uh, of course, again, historical reasons uh, that small countries need to be able to make their own decisions. And finally, and then I'll say uh, so conclude, but the EU, Finland tried very long to push for a common EU defense as, as NATO seemed, uh, not in the sort of immediate future of Finland. So that really didn't fly well. And uh, I think we have at least abandoned that, although it's important, but I don't think it can replace NATO. So thanks. Okay, Hans, why don't you? Uh... Yeah. Thank you. Um... I, when, when I look at the Swedish and the Finnish uh, decision-making, my, my impression is, and you, uh, this is a question both to, to Katja and to August, uh, my feeling is somehow that there was one decision-maker in Sweden and Finland, and that was Minister. It seemed to me that he was the guy who was actually deciding things. It was, Sweden was more or less dragged into this uh, especially the social democrats in Sweden were very hesitant, as far as I can see. And uh, also Sanna Marin was, I mean, she, she, I, I don't feel that she was so-called, that she was the actual decision maker. I, it, it seems to me that he was actually an Easter who made up, up his mind, but I'm, I'm happy to hear if, 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 uh, what, what you say about this, because it may be, just be my impression. Then one little short question to August. What about this, uh, as we speak, this scandal going on in Sweden, in Sepo, 
there are two uh, two uh, spies that have been caught and and uh, two brothers actually one of them working uh, high level on high level in Sepo and has, has allegedly delivered all kinds of things uh, to Russia so so it's very very little we hear in the news about it but uh, it may be the biggest thing uh, since Venezuela if but, but can you tell me a little more about that thank you Okay, I'll, I'll turn it back to, uh, to uh, uh, let me just remind our audience that Sweden has had uh, historically during the Cold War a, a few very uh, colorful and, and, and uh, important uh, espionage issues. So that's why this may be, may be just more than just a, uh, a minor news item. Uh, August, go ahead. Yeah, absolutely. I can, I can start there. I, to be honest, I... I, I don't know a lot of the details about this either. I, I probably know just as much as viewers as, you know, following the news. But but of course, I mean, it is a huge scandal if they've had access to this, you know, top secret information as, uh, I mean, apparently they, they, they've been, or one of the brothers has uh, been employed at the, the highest sort of, uh, what do you say, the most secretive department, which is, you know, uh, at the Swedish equivalent of basically the CIA, I assume, uh, most the military, yeah, also military under at the system. I'm not going to try to <laughs> translate that, but uh, but anyway, um, yeah. So I mean that that in itself is a huge scandal, and apparently they have found um, you know uh, Google searches of uh, you know on their computers, which is indicating that they have uh, connections to the GRU. The, the Russian military um, intelligence service. So uh, it, it definitely seems like they are uh, Russian spies, but uh, right now the details are are very you know few. Um, so I can't really say much more than that. But uh, yeah, a lot of things that I want to pick up on. Um, I just first a question that I had when, when listening to, to Katja's uh, presentation. You mentioned that the the likelihood of sort of Finland joining NATO without Sweden. Um, or that they would join alone, basically, that that could increase uh, over time. Um, can you sort of tell me a little bit more about how likely that is? You know, uh, you know, how, how long time do we have, basically, until Finland uh, goes its own way? Um, yeah, and then I have a few other questions, but I, I just want to respond to a few of the things that Eric brought up as well. And, and of course, uh, regarding the diplomacy issue, whether or not... Uh, the war sort of could end through diplomacy, through the you know diplomatic actions of of Sweden, Finland, and, and perhaps Denmark. I, I think uh, right now it seems quite unlikely that we would play a um, uh, an important role in this. Uh, not least because it seems that uh, if not the U.S. sort of as a, if if the U.S. wouldn't be the main partner in those diplomatic negotiations, I think Zelensky has shown quite clearly that he prefers the Normandy format. In other words, uh, meetings between uh, the leaders of of France, Germany, um, Russia, and and Ukraine. Um, that seems to be the the go to um, or the 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 go to third countries, so to speak. Uh, if uh, if the if the U.S. isn't is involved. Uh, so that I think is more likely that we would see that. And then regarding uh, CSDP, so so EU uh, military cooperation, if that strengthens or weakens NATO, this is of course a a long debate uh, going back uh, even to Mad Madeleine Albright when when she was Secretary of State or Defense. Sorry, now I forgot <laughs> which one. Anyway, yeah, um, but. Uh, yeah, I, I think this discussion has at least uh, decreased a little bit now during the Biden administration, at least compared to the Trump administration. Uh, during the Trump administration, there was a lot of focus that, uh, or a lot of, I would say, uh, complaints, uh, you know, uh, towards the EU that uh, that the new um, defense cooperation uh, projects that that started up as a Sort of response to uh, the the uh, annexation of, of Crimea in 2014, as well as Brexit, and also uh, due to uh, the election of Trump um, and sort of the transatlantic unsecurity that that came from that. Um, I think the the Trump administration was quite uh, pessimistic that this could lead to um, 
let's say, uh, non complementary uh, military structures. So in other words, that uh, deepening cooperation would lead to military structures that uh, the EU would maybe use instead of using NATO uh, in, in uh, certain conflicts. And there, sort of the US, of course, loses control. It's also an issue of military defense industry uh, competition, where if the EU sort of strengthens their own cooperation on, on the defense industrial um, aspects, then that, of course, is a direct competitor to US military industry. Uh, now, I think the, the Biden administration has taken a much more sort of pragmatic view, if you will, that they view this type of cooperation as necessary in order to strengthen EU's military uh, security. Uh, and therefore, that they are more, they see it as more I guess, complementary to NATO in a sense, uh, the stronger the EU gets, the stronger NATO also becomes in that, in that sense. So uh, yeah, I, I think there has been a shift there um, just to, to answer your question. Yeah. Okay, um, before I uh, send it around to the panel again, uh, for this issue, we have gotten a couple of questions. Uh, one I'll just answer very quickly uh, to save time. Uh, this was in response to Hans's presentation about the opt-outs, the Danish opt-out. It's a long story, but in 1992, uh, Denmark rejected the European treaty uh, and for change, and uh, it, it was negotiated a, a new treaty that allowed Denmark uh, to have uh, several uh, reservations or opt-outs, as they've been called, and uh, the, the, uh, gradually some of them have been have been re re reduced by Denmark, and Denmark has required politically a referendum, a national referendum on these issues. So that was the, and it was really an important, uh, uh, you might say, weather vane of of how Danish attitudes have changed, as Hans mentioned. Uh, that in in June of this year, the Danes overwhelmingly, I think over something close to 65% of the voters uh, voted to get rid of the opt-out, which has not been the case with earlier uh, referenda that has not been so popular. Second question is interesting, uh, and that uh, by uh, 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 Miss Allen, Louise Allen, uh, asks about uh, civil defense preparations uh, in your countries. Um, uh, has there been any domestic change and let me expand it because one of the things we've seen in Ukraine is how effective uh, and brave uh, National Guard or territorial defense forces have been. Um, all of your countries do rely upon a mobilization process, a small standing force and a large mobilization. Um, but maybe you could say, uh, if you have a chance, uh, say a word about um, civil defense and, uh, and and territorial guard or territorial defense, which um, seems to be more important than we thought as a result of the experience in Ukraine. If anyone wants to take a, a whack at that, maybe Katya would start on that. Uh, yes, thank you so much. Uh, quick comments on the defense, civilian defense. Uh, there has not been, you know, Finland has had a, uh, or practiced comprehensive security. Um, it's of course not defense per se, but but like engaging all of society and different ministries and so forth in security, societal security. So I would say that's one um, thing that that characterizes Finland. I mean everything from trying to uh, separate disinformation, uh, school children learn about disinformation, and different ministries uh, prepare together. So that's a broad understanding of security. And now lately we have seen a discussion about including all women in conscription. And uh, this has been, of course, going on before uh, the Ukrainian war, but I think it now will be a, a bigger discussion here in Finland. We, it doesn't obviously mean everybody would go, but then you would be required to do some uh, civilian uh, courses like two or three months on, on something related to crisis situations. So something will happen there, I'm sure. And then if I may respond to Hans's question of, well, it was more of a comment on Minister and, and him making the decisions for Sweden and Finland of both. So I would say it's, it's the sort of hybrid decision-making formula we have in, in Finland. So the president leads the foreign policy together with the sort of government and prime minister. 
but the president the unofficial uh, informal work division of work is that the president uh, deals with the great powers and the prime minister with the eu affairs so there's a natural reason that needs has been at the forefront of course he's also the commander in chief of the military so which makes it more in his uh, territory as well uh, and then on on uh, August concerns on Finland abandoning Sweden. I don't think that's very immediate in the near future. I certainly hope not. But there has been more critical voices now in the media and among some researchers that we should uh, consider moving forward alone if this is stuck until next summer, for example. So. Um, I think uh, the president has clearly said that this is not an option. There's no idea in NATO planning for Finland and not including Sweden and so forth. Seems very realistic. Then again, Prime Minister Marin has said that nothing is carved in stone. So, so uh, let's hope that the situation uh, will get to resolve otherwise. I think that's it and, and over to others. Thanks. Uh, August, what, have you had some additional comments? Uh, or uh, Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, just on this, uh, I guess I'm just saying the same things as, as Katja. I feel like not very surprising. Uh, no, but regarding the civil defense in, in Sweden, there has, of course, uh, been a, a quite large shift, I would say, uh, over the past year uh, and even before that. But but. Um, there has been sort of a push towards um, what do you say, a total defense, we call it here, essentially the same thing as comprehensive defense, I, I would assume in, in Finland, the idea that the society should be protected and the societal sort of key infrastructures to support society. So access to food, energy, healthcare, uh, stuff like that. Um, so it is, it's almost like, you know, crisis preparedness. Um, and there has been a lot more funding given to our um, civil defense contingencies agency, I think it's called. Um, and um, yeah, so th there has, of course, been a, a big shift. And I think Sweden is also one of the, the biggest sort of uh, promoters to have increased um, what do you say, funding through the EU also uh, for civil defense missions and operations uh, abroad. Um, to have sort of a balance between the the EU's role as a military and and civilian actor in that sense, um, now that there has been a, a much bigger push also uh, to increase military cooperation through the EU uh, due to the Russian invasion. Um, yeah, and then just a comment on on Hans and and the um, idea that it's it's all Nina's <laughs> fault, or we should thank him maybe I guess. Uh, <laughs> Depends on how you see it. Um, yeah, and I, I think you're cr completely correct in the sense that the Social Democrats were, to a large degree, dragged into the decision. Um, I'm not sure if it is him, like Nineste himself, who, who uh, pushed for it, but uh, it was very clearly a choice that a, that a large part of the Social Democratic Party did not want to take, uh, and they had to change their uh, mentality regarding this very very quickly um the politicians themselves the you know Hultqvist who I referred to earlier uh, very very clearly states that that he you know came to this conclusion himself by discussing with his colleagues he even refers to a precise uh, time like I think it's like 8 30 in the morning when he was in a meeting in a in a basement at the uh, Swedish Ministry of Defense and he gets this report about uh, you know the 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 Russian invasion and it's yeah I, I'm not sure if you should believe that but but based off of that sort of uh, claim I guess then then it has much more to do about the the threat towards Sweden or the potential threat of, of uh, Russia towards Sweden than than just Nienister, uh, but yeah, that's that's uh, all I think I know, and I think we we can know essentially um, from this. 
Okay, okay. Uh, let me, uh, we are running uh, now, it is now two, uh, two o'clock here in the US and even later, of course, in Europe. Uh, maybe I'll just, uh, like in a football game, uh, you allow a couple of minutes of overtime um, because one question that did come up in uh, from one of our audience uh, and uh, it, it intrigued me too. I didn't come back to it. Uh, the Russian uh, minority or Russian emigre population in Finland, I think uh, Katya said it was about 85,000. And I assume she means mostly post 1990 or uh, immigrants uh, from Russia. But there's also, of course, been a, 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 an influx of Russian men uh, who are not anxious to visit the Ukraine uh, in Russian uniforms. Uh, so is, there, is, is this a, a sudden change in the population or is it uh, uh, something that Finns are used to? Well, uh, it's a very valid and good question. I would say it's, it's not a sudden change, no. It's been going on since the post-Cold War and of course a bit during the Cold War, it's marriages and uh, people being having dual citizenship, citizenships, but it's Finland didn't accept dual nationality until very recently. So now it has become a problem because now, of course, it's about land acquisition, it's about property in critical places, infrastructure ownership with people that are Russian, it's about uh, dual nationals in the uh, military service. So now it suddenly it has become a hot topic. And uh, I would say the, of course, the difficult thing is for the ordinary Russian living in Finland and uh, being, even though we have been said, you know, the government has urged us not to sort of be hostile against the Russian speaking a minority because this would be something that Putin could use against us but there is some yes some people yeah they meet some sort of hostility still every now and 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 then and also they are torn I would say among themselves whether they listen to the western uh, media the western narrative or the Russian narrative and and I've read many stories of people having to break with their relatives in, in Russia because they have simply can't agree on, on, on this war issue and who started what. Uh, so it's very divisive and, uh, and we of course hope that it sort of will not materialize into something, a concrete security threat in Finland and I don't believe that, but, but it, it has started to come up for discussion more and more. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I think we will follow the clock now and uh, thank our panelists for their excellent and concise presentations. I hope this will uh, not be the last time that uh, uh, the American Scandinavian Foundation brings us Scandinavian experts uh, on these uh, important topics. Let me thank them individually and I'll turn it back to Ed uh, Gallagher if he wants to uh, say a final word. Thank you, uh, Eric, and thank you to all the panelists. Uh, it's been a fascinating and uh, enlightening discussion, and I hope we can have another one. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, this um, uh, program will be available on our website, ScandinaviaHouse.org, as well as on our YouTube channel. And there you will also find a wide variety of other programs dealing with the arts, politics, and social issues in the Nordic countries, uh, furthering the mission of the ASF, which since uh, 1910 has been devoted to creating greater understanding between the Nordic countries and the United States and international goodwill. So uh, please join us on those channels and on our website. And again, Eric, Katya, August, and Hans, thank you very much. It's been really a terrific program. So I hope we can do it again. Thank you.